Cool. I'm on it. Sounds good. Let's go. Oh. All right, okay, we're off. <laughs> so it's the last day of Tour Down Under 2018 yeah. and I'm sitting in the hotel uh, of race headquarters and talking with Rod Ellingworth. <coughs> it's a name I think a lot of people are familiar with, um, but you don't do a lot of media. But um, it's... Fine, uh, I wonder if... Uh, let's define your role with Team Sky for a start. Let's okay. just get things underway that way. You're the trainer and... Um... Uh, yeah, I'm one of the coaches of the team, yeah. So I've had various different titles in the team. But I think mainly it's just, you know, there's a core group of us who do quite a lot of different jobs within the team. So we don't just sort of stick to doing one thing. So I sort of, um, at the moment, coach six riders. <clears throat> and then I sort of performance manage the the grand tours uh, more than anything, and that means sort of all the getting everything in line, all the communication together, making sure that we're sort of no stone unturned going into the grand tours really, and I ha I help that process move along really. So it's all a bit of a big jigsaw, but it does come together, you know, and work quite well really. And you've been with the team <clears throat> since inception, obviously. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I've been working with Dave now, I think it's like 17, 18 years. I've been actually with Dave at British Cycling before uh, and then into this team, so yeah. Everyone's sort of used to <clears> the, <throat> the massive wealth of the Sky Armada. Mm. And uh, I was, you were telling me the other day about the, the old days of riding with British Cycling down in Cronulla in the south of Sydney. Yeah. And I, I do remember it was pretty much a shoestring budget for a little while before lottery came involved. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, once the lottery funding sort of kicked in in the UK, which was sort of towards the late 90s. Um, I mean, I, I wasn't um, involved then. I was still riding my bike myself at that point. But, um, you know, that, that was a big turning point. But I think it wasn't just that, you know, I think it was the plans put together by Peter Keane uh, and the focus on the Olympic medals and, and that elite team, you know, and, and the focus. I mean, if, you, if I don't know if anybody ever got hold of that report, you know, it was very much about... Um, first Olympic success, but then potentially a professional cycling team tagged on the back of it, you know, and being uh, the world's number one cycling nation by, I think, 2012. So we weren't too far off that goal, really, yeah. But I, I guess we can talk a lot about other things, but I'm going to have to ask the obvious question to yeah. get things underway. <clears throat> yeah. Um, there's the situation with Chris Froome, mm -hmm. we understand the complexities of it. Yeah. Is there any way that you can sort of give a little overview on how the, def let's call it a defence, is going to be presented? What, um, not really. I mean, I, I haven't really been involved no. uh, in that, you know, and I think this is one of the things that we, we try and do in this team is keep um, uh, keep keep things in, in line. And, and, you know, that isn't my my job within the team. And, I, you know, that's why I'm here is I've, I've coached four of the riders who are here, very much focused on tour down under, uh, and this year for these younger guys and moving them forward. So, um, you know, that's the, 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 the rest of the politics of the team, whatever, is, is completely left with, with Dave, Fran Miller uh, and people like that who, who deal with, with these sort of situations. So, you know, I know we're, we're sort of um, confident in what we're doing with, with Chris. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, it's, I, think, I think enough's been said in terms of statements gone out by the team. And, and you know, and like I say, it's left with them to, to deal with it, really. My, I'm concentrating just on here and and, yeah. the, and this year really. But you you can't give any specifics about how the reading became double the allowed limit. Uh, no, no, I don't. I don't really want to add to the story. Really, no. I think it would just be more waffle. That is, there's enough out there. Uh, yeah. People are speculating. I don't think it's my job to speculate or to add to the story. So yeah. Sure. So I guess <clears> we just call that a work in progress. And Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're working with all the, the relevant people. You know, we, we want it to to be uh, done as quickly, but, you know, in, in the right way. Um, I think it's essential that it's done properly and, and, and really thoroughly looked at by all the different parties, you know. Would you anticipate that he'll ride the Giro on the tour this year? I don't know. I think that's, you know, uh, again, that's left to others to decide, really. Your role is one of, there's many people working <clears> with Sky. Can you just give us an overview of the, the staff that's behind a Tour de France campaign? Um, in the, the tour, yeah, numbers. I mean, I think we, we normally work anywhere between sort of 
21, 23 staff uh, actually working on the race. And then obviously you've got the, the riders on top of that. So um, we sort of carry quite a lot of performance staff um, depending on the riders. So we do try and take the coaches with us on the races because you, you do find that they have a role to play at, at, that, at that point. Um, so obviously Dave's there, we've got the coaches there, the sport director's there. I'm there as a coach and as a performance manager, sort of pulling that together, there's the media guys. Um, we normally have one, if not two chefs with us. Um, physios, uh, carers, we normally have five to six carers on the race, four mechanics. Um, yeah, so it's quite a, quite a large group. The, the, the income stream for cycling is limited. Mm. You know, it's a, yeah. there's no gate take. There's no. No. You're relying on sponsors and more <coughs> yeah. than sponsorship alone, yeah. and ideally some broadcast, but the mm. broadcast rights. But there's not much of that. No. Um, so you're and Sky yeah. has become an anomaly because you have more or less what seems like an unlimited budget. Does it mm. feel that way to you? No, not really. I, I think that's again that's speculation. You know, I think there's a lot of talk. I don't think people know exactly what it is, mm. and I'm pretty sure there's several, you know, several. There's a few other teams who are running on a similar budget or have similar sort of access to, to, to funds. You know, um, I mean, I, again, you know, I don't really get too involved in that. You know, as as a coach and a performance manager, you put your plans in, and we, um, you know, we 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 do really focus on performance. We, we don't sort of try and carry too much of anything else. Um, you know, we're, we're more, we've got less sports directors than other teams and more coaches maybe than other teams. But when I think when you look at the overall numbers, it's, it's pretty similar because uh, some teams are running on more, definitely with more sport directors than what we do. Uh, so we just structure our team a little bit different. But I think the unlimited budget is, you know, I, again, I've heard it a few times from people, but I, I think it's... Um, that's that's not correct, you know. And I, I can't get you to be the spokesman for the broader sky picture, but it's yeah. interesting to start the discussion that way, you know. Just yeah, to... sure. I mean, I mean, you know, I think as as a as a team, you know, we've, we we do have ambition, mm. and we, we 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 strive forward all the time, and and um, you know, you know, we're not just a we're not just a cycling team trying to win some bike races. We we're a we're a cycling team with. Um, real big goals and ambitious goals um, within the sport but also to take our sponsors with us our sponsors are happy with us that's the thing and that's why they keep investing you know we're not just we don't just sit on the settee and watch bike racing each and every single one of us are out there with the sleeves rolled up and we, and we work bloody hard um, and I think if you work hard <clears throat> which we have done for many years now people see that the results come and people you know you, you're giving them good return so without a good return, you don't get any money. Is that need to get the good return? Is that where you're pushing the envelope perhaps a little too far sometimes, you know, with the Bradley, let's call it a scandal of last year? I get, I get, you know, it's one of them, everybody will read their own way into it. Um, I think, um, I, no, I, I think we, we do it, we do it as best we can. And, and you know, within every single rule that we, we can, there's no stepping outside of that. So, um, you know, we, but we do push hard. Of course, we do. You know, we want to be successful, and um, but it's but it's elite sport. You know, it's not amateur sport and just um, playing a game. You know, we're we're out there taking this seriously, and people invest in our team, uh, and we take that as seriously. You know, they want return on the money, so um, you know, we're not just on holiday. It's the sporting element that you that's your expertise. Mm. So let's rip into, we've done all of the sort of the, the background work. And okay. I feel like I've, you know, tried to elicit some, some, some uh, confirmation on how Sky is going to manage certain elements of their mm. remit right. uh, that they're undergoing at the moment. But yeah. now let's talk about the riders you're training okay. and what you get, what, what you bring to the party to make them better riders. Can yeah. you name the four, for example, that you have here? Uh, well, Halverson was here. Obviously, he's gone home now. Yes. Um, so, Lawless, Owen Dool, and uh, Divin. Okay. Yeah. So, we, if we consider Owen Dool, for example, he's, mm. um, he's come full circle for in your kind of um, bike rider, uh, insofar that you had a history with the Pursuit team. Yeah. You made them into a 
gold win medal mm. winning machine, a mm. world record setting machine. Yeah. He did exactly that in Rio, and now he's yeah he's followed your path uh, back to Sky. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the the pursuit connection. You've, yeah. you've turned pursuers into Tour de France champions. Yeah. What are you going to do with someone like Owen Dool? <coughs> well, I I, th I think you know um, when back in sort of uh, 2004 when I started the academy sort of program. Um, a lot of what I tried to focus on was was two things really. One was there was the British Olympic program, and that was about delivering gold medals. So, and I was working with riders with the focus on trying to pay back to British cycling by winning worlds and Olympic medals mm. on the track or road. But you know, um, I always think the track is a young man's game, more so, and I think um, it's a really good stepping stone and a good development and good learning, discipline, everything. You know, it, it teaches you so much about this sport if it's done in the right environment. Um, but with all, all, always this add-on that they want to make a career of cycling. And I think if you, you know, you could line up 100 10 to 14 year old lads, girls, whatever, and say, right, what do you want to be? They'll all want to win an Olympic gold medal, most of them. If, they, if they're serious about being competitive, Olympic gold medals, world medals, and then they'll want to earn money from cycling, you know, and they'll want to be professional bike riders. And I know the lads will talk about Paris Roubaix and Tour de France's. And so for me, it's about following dreams. Mm -hmm. And I think if a, if if a group of people who are also passionate about the sport can get behind them, um, you know, you 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 can sort of achieve quite big things with people, you know. And I think that's that's always been my drive. So so Owen's been very much in that program. Mm. Um, so you know, going down that team pursuit role. Um, and, and you know, fortunately, won that gold medal, and and now he, you know, he wants to earn his money and be in the best bike races in the world. So, you know, so it's perfect, really. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, we know, for instance, like Kirienka, you know, he came from that track background. We we've known him a long time, um, and you can just see the discipline in these guys. And you know, it's, it's different to say the Colombian guys who are racing. In a different environment, don't come through a track background. You know, there is definitely a different approach. Mm. Um, you, I, we see it a lot with the Australian guys who have come through the AIS system, and you know, they've got that sort of they, they know how to be coached. Whereas some other people, it takes them a little while to know how to use people around them because quite often they've had to do it on their own. You know. I mean, it's an interesting example, and it is relevant because you see um, Bradley Wiggins as a pursuer, you know, yeah. he, he, the individual pursuit and team pursuit, and he's yeah. a key player in, in a lot of track events yeah, when sure, he started yeah. his career. And it would have always yeah. seemed laughable to think that he'd go on to win the Tour de France. France yeah. um, you stripped him back, yeah. mm. dropped a ton of weight. Yeah, and turned him into a tour champion. And yeah. you're doing a similar thing with Geraint Thomas, you know. Yeah, we're trying with Geraint. Yeah, and I think that's you know another one. You know, I think Geraint rode the, his first tour in 2007, and I remember talking to him through that. And yeah, you know, he was like the first rider out the back. He was in the Gruppetto every day, you know. And and it's a learning curve. Cab was that was his first Tour de France as well, and he was straight off the track. And so I think it can be done with the right attitude. You know, the it's, the bike rider is going to want to do it. Mm. Um, we see the same with Pete Kenner. You know, um, he's the Olympic champion on the track, and you know, so so I think it's it's really doable. You know, um, it's it's not out of the way. These are really talented people. Mm. You know, and I think with the right, right frame of mind and the right people behind them, they can do it. There's so much emphasis on weight. Mm. Are you, uh, <coughs> I spoke with yeah. Alan Davis about this a couple of days ago, where he yeah. was he was of the opinion that. That, that, that it's almost an aesthetic trend that people want to be super skinny just so yeah, that yeah. they can Instagram how skinny they are. Mm. Not necessarily mm. at, the, at, at, at Bradley Wiggins or Chris Froome level, mm. but are there some athletes who might perform a little better with a little bit yeah, more well, weight? Well, I th you know, I think it's the key question. I don't think it's anything new. Um, you know, the power to weight and the actual balance between being able to hold decent power or not, you know, and, and the balance between climbing and time trialing, you know, that's 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 what makes the Tour de France or the Grand Tours like a, you know, there's only so many people can win them because mm -hmm. they're so hard to do. Um, and we see people constantly getting it wrong. And and that's where, you know, the bike riders at times, they, they take it on themselves in the wrong way and they can make quite big mistakes and, and it costs them for quite a long time if they go too far with it. 
but you're just trying to get the balance. Some people, I think, hold the weight off easier than others, and they don't really ever have a problem, you know. So, so it's just it is just about getting the balance. Um, but certainly for the guys coming off the track, it's it's quite a challenge for them. Mm. Um, mainly because maybe for the early years in their career, they've not had to really think about, um, you know, really stripping down the weight. Um, they've they've got to be good, obviously, uh, and and in good nick. But there's a difference between being strong and in good nick and then being able to climb and and being good nick. So <clears throat> that that can that balance can be quite difficult to get right. And I guess that's why Bradley Wiggins was such a great case example <clears throat> because mm. he went track road back to track. And I think when you look at that Rio Team Pursuit squad, he basically led that team. Mm. You know, I don't think it was. Um, uh, uh, yeah, you know, he 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 drove the program, if you like, what they were going to do and how they were going to do it, and what the mindset was going to be. I think he was very, very much the big player in there with with Ed Clancy. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and he has the potential. I mean, his legacy is lasting. I mean, mm. if you look at the the Sky remit from the get go, it yeah. was to um, win the Tour de France, and in so doing, I guess, attract people to the sport. Yeah, and Bradley certainly did that. Like, mm. I think the uptake of cycling. Since yeah, he's gone massive. In yeah. the last, since his successful years, yeah, has been I think, enormous. <clears throat> yeah, I think there was a build there. I don't think it was, you know, I, I certainly think Team Sky and the, you know, it's like the icing on the cake sort of thing. But you know, I do, I, you know, I, I live in the UK. I live in an area where which is quite popular for cycling, and it's amazing the transformation in the UK mm. uh, and seeing people um, on bikes and riding bikes every every day, every weekend in particular. Um, but I do think, you know, your Chris Hoy's, your Vicky Pendleton's, um, all these sort of names have also had a huge part to play. And, and you know, that's through the Olympic programme. <clears throat> and then I think, you know, it shifted then to the, the road programme. And I think, you know, uh, when you look at just how many people go watch the Tour de France, you know, that, that's, that's the big shop window. Mm. Um, so I think Team Sky's done a really good job in, in that, you know. And that's part of that, you know, I was talking earlier about that sort of, the big ambition. It's not just the bike race and there is an ambition, mm. you know, and, and certainly like myself, I think Dave's pretty similar. You know, I, I remember going to junior world championships with nothing and, and a lot of other nations thinking, who the hell are you lot, you know? Um, so I've got quite a lot of drive in me to, to sort of put British cycling on the map, you know, um, and, mm. and, sh and fly the flag f for British cycling and say, well, you know, we are a good, we are a good nation. And when we decide to do something, we can do it, you know? You know, and people shouldn't just look at the Team Sky era. It started years back. Mm. That build and that, um, you know, and, and the the um, showing people what we're capable of doing started a long time ago. You know, and that's why people have invested in this team. Um, and considering your history, I'm going to go to a pet topic of mine, and that's the... Um, well, it's, to be honest, it's my disdain for the Olympics. I find it kind of a little bit abhorrent that so much money is given to the IOC sports carnival. Yeah. And I understand that it offers inspiration. And you've referenced Victoria <coughs> and Vicky Pendleton and, and mm. the inspiration that they have offered to an, a, a nation as a whole. Yeah, sure. And I, I, I see the benefit. I, I get that. I understand it. Mm. But in Australia, we have an, uh, the government remit for sport, or yeah. particularly for the funding of cycling in, in our example, is that they need to win Olympic gold medals. Yeah. You've, you've achieved that with yeah. your, um, your association with British Cycling, but then <coughs> you've also achieved success on the road. And by, for my line of thinking, sorry, it's a long question, mm. for my line of thinking, um, the, the road program makes more sense because it's a more tangible thing and that's why people, because people can relate to it easier. Yeah, it's okay. It's more accessible. Mm. You can go and road, ride a road bike mm. either, on, yeah, sure, yeah. either on Zwift or, <coughs> or on mm. the road, mm. whereas getting onto well, a velodrome is not quite so simple. This, I think the thing is it's not just, you know, I mean, I can't talk obviously for Australia no, uh, um, and, and the, uh, but it, from, from a UK sport point of view, it's about, you know they're they're given money um, to to deliver Olympic medals and and obviously they pitch that across all sports mm. so they don't see cycling any different to hockey or to swimming so you know it's about delivering medals generally across uh, for the nation um, <clears throat> I think this is where sometimes the 
um, governing, you know, bigger governing bodies like UK Sports. It doesn't always match with the individual sport. So I totally understand what you mean, but you know, obviously our business model was, um, you know, to generate to generate cash to continue the program. You've got to win medals. Um, I think the I think it's a lot harder to to perform on the road. It's like mountain biking. You know, it's a it's a harder sort of. Um, the odds are, are a lot less, aren't they? You know, and therein basically. lies the problem, because yeah. if you look at the stats of cycling, it will certainly take anecdotal evidence right, mm. going out on a weekend. Mm. You're going to see thousands of people riding road bikes. You're yeah. going to see thousands of people riding mountain bikes. You're going mm. to see probably thousands of kids riding BMX bikes. Yeah, yeah. And you'll probably see 10 or 15 on track bikes. Yeah, I mean, um, it, it, Manchester's completely booked up all the time. Right. Um, I think London's doing pretty well. I think Newport, I think the, the tracks in the UK are actually doing a good job at the moment. Mm. I know, um, yeah, I, get, I, I wouldn't know the numbers or anything, but um, you know, from eight in the morning till 10 at night, Manchester track is booked near enough every day, seven days a week. Mm. Um, so I think there's a lot of people, but there is a restriction obviously, because you can only allow so many people at a time. And I think, I, I know for British cycling, we have to, uh, book our session six months in advance or something, you know, to to guarantee we've got the sessions, you know, um, um, you know, and, it, and, it, and and there's talk also about, you know, um, there isn't many sports where you have a facility yet you share it with the public. Mm -hmm. So Manchester United don't share their, you know, they don't have to scrap for their time on the pitch, you know, but yeah. but that's how cycling sort of run a little bit like swimming, isn't it? You know, yeah, yeah. the whole reason why swimmers swim at five in the morning is. So they're outside of the school times and the schools carry on with their school programme and the elite swimmers used to in the day have to swim at five o'clock in the morning. I'm not track so, bashing either. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm yeah. a big fan of track cycling. Mm. I'm just um, observing the sport, yeah. the, well, all, <clears throat> all aspects of the sport. Yeah, and to yeah. See how it could be a bit more equal. And I, th I, th I think that's exactly why um, why the, the, the last few years within British Cycling, the, the membership and the volume of people has absolutely accelerated mm. because there is, there is a lot of people watch cycle, road cycling a lot more. You watch it on telly all the time and everything. So, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, but, you know, there, there is that business model. And, you know, the, the, the governing bodies say we just want Olympic medals, don't we? You know, yeah. that's their cash basically yeah and I, I i i get it and you watch what happened in london and that you know yeah. it was must have been phenomenal fantastic to be yeah part. yeah for, i mean that was you know when when you when you look back you know perhaps never ever work in such an environment ever again you know that was just incredible to yeah. see how many people yeah. were there you know and I, I i i all i did was the road events the, the road and the time trial um I came straight in off the tour you know managed managed that sort of block through but it was just crackers, you know. Yeah, great experience. What yeah. A buzz, yeah. yeah, 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 really good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah just because we're talking about um, road and track. Yeah. Was the Madison at the World Championships in London won by Bradley Wiggins and Mark Cavendish yeah. the best uh, hour of cycling entertainment in the last <laughs> twenty years? Do you know? Um, I love the Madison race. Yeah really do um i was really disappointed when it was taken out of the olympics because i think one because of the the work i'd done on the madison with all the young lads at that time um you know i just i, I think it's a complete event it teaches you so much about the sport uh, and you can go in any direction if you can ride a good madison you can go in a lot of different directions so from a development sort of piece madison cycling is absolutely like for me, it's the one of the key cycling disciplines you can do. Um, so I worked a lot on it, you know, and I did all the six days with all the young lads and and all that, you know. And I was with Brad and Cav when they first won in two eight. I was trackside with them there doing that, you know. Um, so I've experienced a lot of really good moments. I mean, I, I think that's where the track, you know, uh, is a is a great sort of discipline, and um, you can get some great moments in the velodrome. But yeah, I mean, you know. Cavs won the Madison three times, I think. Oh, it's uh, not about winning the world title. It's about yeah, the atmosphere um, inspiring and, a, yeah, a yeah. crowd. I mean, th the yeah. atmosphere at the Lehigh Velodrome that day must have just been... just. Well, I spoke to quite ridiculous. a lot of people who were there and just watching, and they just said it was so intense. And then when Cav crashed, and 
Yeah, yeah, no, brilliant moment, yeah. And there was action the whole time. Yeah. Like when Cav and Wigo took the lap, mm. I just, there were, I had goosebumps just yeah. from the reaction of the crowd. crowd it was yeah. so exciting, you know. It was, it was similar in, I think, I think it was 2008 when they won in Manchester, you know, um, again, home worlds, and they took a late lap, and the crowd were just going nuts, you know, and it was, yeah, great. Really good moments, actually. Yeah, yeah. I sort—I've sort of said it to a few people when they've interviewed me, and they said, "What's your best moment?" I, I've sort of said that a few times, actually. You know, because um, like, okay, like Bradley winning the Tour de France and Chris winning the Tour de France, really good. But you sort of don't get the sense of that like excitement the same. Because it builds slow. Well, yeah, and I'm just always knackered when it comes <laughs> to the Tour. <laughs> so you sort of, you're like, oh, that's a relief, you know, where, like, that's the that's what I really like about track cycling is it's there, boom, it's instant, isn't it, you know? Mm. Where the road cycling is like, yeah, yeah, yeah it yeah. takes a long time. <laughs> and I guess that's why 2020 cricket's popular, because the test takes so exactly, long, yeah. and just end up in a draw. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah and that's that completely, yeah. Or because the Australians beat the Poms. They're not at the minute in the one days that they've taken a bit of the kicking. Yeah, you see. Hey, now, that's what always happens here. (laughs) When I speak to quite a few Australians and they give it when the old Poms lose, but when it's the other way around, they go, oh, I haven't been watching. I didn't think you had. (laughs) You're all the the same. (laughs) It's funny that we're talking about cricket at the end of a chat about cycling because I think that there there is that, um, that momentum shift at the moment where it... What had traditionally been in Australia, um, cricket in summer, football in winter, yeah. is changing. And uh, yeah. I guess media allows that to happen. People have been introduced to the beauty of cycling yeah. um, in in recent years with Cadell winning and with you know and, and in Australia. Yeah, sure. And um, and also increased broadcast and all sorts of things. And the mm. same applies in in your country. <coughs> yeah, very much so. Yeah, I mean, cycling was you know not really thought much of, I don't think, sort of 20, 25 years ago in the UK, but, you know, it's just, I mean, it's, it's crazy now, you know, and, and, and for sometimes all, you know, it builds and then you get quite negative things, but, you know, you would never think that it would be such an impact. Oh, I never did in my lifetime of cycling, you know, that's why it's nice to be part of it, actually, and, and, and feel like I've actually, you know, been at the heart of it, because cycling's my, my life, everything, you know, um, so yeah, so it's it's nice to be part of it. Yeah. Well, it was a pleasure to talk to you about soccer. And yourself, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having a chat. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Yeah. Good stuff. Thanks. It's nice it's like... to explore some topics there. Yeah, just some different sort of areas, isn't it?